1190. While the West was busy crusading and building cathedrals, Asia was being overrun by Mongol horsemen under Genghis Khan. Halt! We'll come here! Horse dung mixed with dried grass, the only fuel they were able to find. See the Tadralites? They're not far, Wordy Timogen. You'll find their camp just three days away. We'll come Many thanks, you. my friends. <laughs> All right, boys, let's kill these traitors. Let's bash their brains in! And that, my friends, is how Temujin, with his handful of men, began the lifetime of conquest that would one day make him Genghis Khan, master of one of history's greatest empires. claimed Khan in 1200. In 1207, he conquered Mongolia and Siberia. In 1209, Tibet. The invasion of China, 1211. Kazakhstan followed in 1218. 1220, the war against Khorasan, which had offended the Mongols and wasn't even sorry. Genghis Khan mustered 200,000 horsemen and supplemented them by arming local Muslims. At the same time, in 1214, at the Battle of Bouvines, French horsemen numbered only 1,000. All right, everybody down there! You'd think there was no greater pleasure in life than to chop up one's enemies, chase them from their homes, lay claim to their goods, reduce their loved ones to tears, and make off with their wives and daughters. And yet, that was the creed of Genghis Khan. When he died at 65, some say he fell from his horse, his empire was immense. But it would grow still larger, added to by sons and grandsons. The most famous was Kublai. On his deathbed, Genghis gave this little boy his special blessing. And if the Pope consents to send me six wise men of the Christian faith, knowledgeable in the seven arts, and if they can debate and prove clearly to us pagans that faith in Christ is the best faith, and that all others are false and evil, then I, the great Khan, and all those at my power will become Christians and liegemen of your church. That is the message the great Kublai Khan sent with the Polo brothers, two wealthy Italian merchants, when they left his court and headed home. Two years later, they returned, bringing with them their hey, son and nephew, how's Marco. How's it going? And we're going to Chipango and Cafe, but first we'll put in an Accra. We've got to see Pope Gregory at Plaisance. And here's Accra. My friends, I'm so sorry, but we'll have to part. Wouldn't a boy with muscles like these be real handy on a ship? Yeah, and how's about some brains? He's smart. Hold on a bit, boys. 
farther, would it be okay to bring another two sturdy boys with us? They might just give us a hand. What a bright idea, Marco. Your friends can come along. Thanks, Pop. I'm gonna tell them. You guys, hey, listen, you're coming. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Holy Father, the great Khan to whose court we are traveling respectfully asks that emissaries be sent out by His Holiness to bear him news of the Western lands and Christianity. This mark of respect may predispose him favorably to our cause. I've got just the thing for you, my boy. But, Holy Father... Yes, yes, here's the holy oil. But we will also need a few ambassadors like these venerable brothers. Uh-huh. How true. Take him along, those two. But wouldn't we be of more use to by remaining here with you, our Holy Father? Uh, <laughs> they fine with you? Well, I had actually hoped to have at the very least six. Oh, nope. Better forget about six. I can't spare six, no. Well, then, how about five? No, no. Or perhaps four? I said no. Well, can I count on two, then? That's what I seem to remember saying. I repeat that Brother Nicholas of Vicenza and Brother William of Tripoli. What the, what's he up to now? Brother William! Brother William! Come out wherever you are. Please come down immediately. You know that ascensions are forbidden without my permission. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven protect me. Listen, someone's coming. You the guys been sent from Cairo coming to invade us? Not at all, just in from Venice, see? <laughs> and how about a nice purse of gold? Why should we settle for one crummy little bag? We might as well take all I got, eh? And besides, who's here to stop us from capturing those ninnies and selling them as slaves? <laughs> Let's give rap these strangers. Ah, <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, yes, sir, a brilliant mission. If we can stay alive, we prefer to. But the orders of the Holy Father. Now, don't take offense, please, but we have to admit we're poor travelers. If you insist. Go ahead, my friends. I will really pray for you. Wait. God keep you safe. I, I do as well. Amen. Our friend's caravan pushed on into the Middle East. One day... Look! It's Noah's Ark. Come now, we really should be moving along. There are the tracks. Just a little further and they'll be able to see just what I'm made of. And another day in Mosul, one moment. What's that dark liquid in those jars? All that oil, Shaheem. Mmm. Ah! Their next stop was Baghdad. Well, we catch him, we'll show him a thing or two or three or four or five. From there, a small sailboat took them to the port of Ormuz on the Persian Gulf. Now we've got him. We've got him cornered for sure. I would be happy to provide you with this magnificent boat, sirs. A safety guaranteed, naturally. Can we be sure that there won't be a leak? Huh? Hey, you trash cans. You wouldn't have set your eyes on any rabble like that. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. If someone asks about us, say we've gone to sea. Uh -huh. You've seen these guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> you just missed them, sir. They're selling away, see? At last, their goose is cooked. Let's go! All aboard, quick! Our friends headed up to Curacao. Then, an unexpected gale pushed from them. Watch out. Ah, this time, folks, they're in our hands. With many setbacks out of the way, our friends were free to pursue their journey, all the way to the foothills of the Hindu Kush. Their crossing was difficult, very difficult and dangerous. But even worse was the Gobi Desert, with its infernal sandstorms. Marco, where are you? Marco, speak to me! Marco! Yes, I'm here, I'm here! Marco! <laughs> Safely across the desert, Polo and his band reached the city of Shamu, hey, renowned for its hospitality. Uh -huh. ah. Hello. Hey, Steph, let's clear out! Ah. Enter. Enter. Even the fiercest of men are sometimes in need of rest. Autumn comes, time to change pastures. Driving their flocks in front of them, the Mongol tribesmen come down from their high plateaus. Get up. Wait a minute. Doesn't he look like... And that one, isn't he our king-sized friend? A strange bunch, those Mongols. The camp settles into a routine. I'll show you who's boss, you puny hunk of livestock. While the hunters are out chasing wolves, back at camp, life goes on normally. Couldn't we go with you? Oh, no. Hey, you there, do you know the law? Hey! The sack! The sack! The sack! The if sack. a thief was able to pay back nine times the amount he stole, he was let off. Three, four, five, six. 
six, seven, eight, and nine. Say there, you've got nothing else to give us? Nothing left. It's empty. If not, he was good for seven lashes, or 17, or 37, up to 107, depending on the severity of his crime. And should anyone make off with a horse, it was off with his life. His body sliced down the middle with a sword. You know, I'm pretty sure that we left those guys behind. Yeah, yeah we're gonna have some fun. Just a real blast, man. Hmm. Just a Kobla informed of your visit, appointed me as your escort and protector in case of need. <laughs> Show us the way, my good friends, to the palace of the great Kubla. They followed the winding Yellow River all the way to Peking, their destination. Polo's journey had lasted nearly four years. Greetings. Greetings. The emperor was the most powerful sovereign to have existed in all of recorded history. They say he was neither short nor tall, a stocky fellow, but well built for all that. A complexion of peaches and cream, dark eyes, noble nose. He had a total of four wives, Yay! as well as hundreds of concubines. The great Kubla also kept a collection of pure white mares, each one spotless, and there were 10,000 of them. The sovereign himself, as well as his sons, drank these mares' milk, which was forbidden to everyone else. The sun illumines her heavenly sons. Today our almighty emperor will receive visits from strange travelers from far away. All right, time to set out for work. Let's move it. Hey, look. Yeah. A oh, goodbye. May I try it? Why, sure. You got anything of my size? Yes, honorable stranger. One second. Lovely, perfect. Of uh, me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Ah. I only have one on me. Oh, that's just fine, sir. Hi. I want the Spiffius tunic of God. At your most humble service. Ah. You are quite splendid, honorable sir. Like a morning star. How much do you want? Mm, uh, four gold pieces? Uh, might as well take five. <laughs> <laughs> this mission will permit you to prove yourselves. I hope you'll measure up. And so our friends pay a visit to the general who is besieging the city of Changfu. Ah. Just look at those ramparts, noble strangers. All our attacks are of no avail. My army is battle weary. I myself am about ready to pack up and leave. Oh. Seems to me we might try and use a couple of those catapults I was talking about. <clears throat> That's great. Now, Marco just happened to be a whiz at picking up Tartar ways, a language both spoken and written. At the same time, he was a very prudent man. Upon his return, Marco told the emperor all about the new and exciting things he had seen. His stories were always witty and pleasing, and included his own solutions to many problems. All this greatly pleased the emperor, who treated Marco as a great favorite. Some believe in Jesus, others in Muhammad, still others in Buddha, but I ask protection from all of them, to be sure. Now, here's your newest mission. Here. At your orders, Great Kubla. Missions came and went, and so did the years. After 17 years of service to the Great Kubla, our friends wanted to go home. But the Great Khan was too fond of them to let them go. Just when they were giving up all hope of seeing their homeland again, three barons from faraway Persia arrived at the court. They requested the emperor to provide their lord with a new wife, his own having died. Ah, very nice. Charming, beautiful. 
Uh, we beg of you, let the Polos accompany us home. Seasoned travelers like them are rare. You would enjoy our heartfelt, boundless gratitude. The Emperor's great respect for his Western adventurers made his decision very difficult, but finally he gave in and requested the Polos to escort the Barons and the Princess. Of course, he had to find himself a new set of advisors. <laughs> There's really not much of a choice left, is there? Oh, yes, there is. Hmm? From the great Khan, our friends received safe conduct, messages for the Christian kings, and... and 13 ships to take them safely home. In view of the trip they were about to make, 13 was none too many. The return trip took three years, and judging by the looks of our friends, we can suppose that it had been no stroll down the primrose path. All right, come in, but you'll have to sleep in the stable. The next day, there was a family reunion. The Polos had been away from home for 24 years. The palace of the Great Khan. Its hall is so vast that 6,000 people could eat there easily. It has too many rooms even to count. All is so, so big and so grand, it leaves me speechless. I can't describe it. It's so lovely. No one would ever build a better world. Well, what do you know? The poor and the sick, old persons and orphans are lodged by the great Khan, and every day hot bread is passed out. In the province of Zandan Dan, when a woman gives birth, she gets right up out of her bed and goes straight to work. Hubby gets in bed instead, takes the baby, and lies there up to 40 days while all his relatives and friends fill his ears with praise. <laughs> oh, come on, that's nonsense. No, it's not, but there's more. Where do you hear this one, folks? The Lord's men harvest great quantities of pith from mulberry trees. It's found just beneath the bark of the tree. From this is made a paper, dark as ink, which they cut up. Even a scrap of the stuff's worth a half a denier. A big sheet is worth one bezant in gold, and so on, and so on, up to ten bezants. On these papers, you see the Signor's seal. He's already made such a huge quantity of the stuff he could cash in all the world's gems. Mark my words, but not just gems. He could swallow up entire kingdoms if he should ever want to. You might not believe what I am about to say, but you just wait. He'll buy out the planet one fine day and pay in cash. In his capital alone are piled the most massive treasures I've seen anywhere in the world. Each day over a thousand cartloads of fine silks pour in, and so Peking's thousands of inhabitants are quite used to dressing in pure silk. Oh, this this silk. fellow exaggerates, uh, folks. Throughout the province of Cathay, there exists a kind of black stone found in the mountains. These amazing black stones burn brightly when lit. You can decide to light a fire in the evening. You'll feel comfy all night. The next day, the black stones still give off heat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a ride. And now we've got burning stones. What next? <laughs> no less than 15,000 boats sail up and down the world's longest river. It flows through Hangzhou, an immense city in which you'd be amazed to see 12,000 bridges. So high, ships of great height may glide beneath them. I tell you that Venice is lofty a ship in full sail could easily pass mast intact. And what is even more interesting is the city was planned and built on water. Oh, oh, very very right. Right. Leave it to me. I'll show him what's what. 1298. Venice is at war with Genoa, its rival city, near the island of Crisola on a Venetian ship. There are quite a few and well armed. This could be a rough battle. To your positions, prepare for combat. <laughs> Our friends put up a good fight, but. Retreat! Run for your lives! We won't be long, Marco. Courage! No man, be he Christian, Saracen, Tartar, or Pagan, had ever set foot in so many lands as did our brave, distinguished friend, Marco Polo. In spite of a few minor mistakes and myths, he gave the Western world its first realistic description of the Far East, which up until his time had been unknown. Two centuries later, Christopher Columbus sailed westward in search of Cathay and the Indies described by Polo. What Columbus discovered instead were the Americas. 